we got our assignments. We went to Camp Stoneman, California. Uh, they set us up on uh, shuttle flights going to Hawaii. And we all trucked aboard the, the bird and they took us to where we were supposed to go and uh, let us off and put, put us in another airplane that was configured a little bit differently and we took us to Guam. And then uh, we did whatever we were supposed to do there and they sent us on to, to Japan and uh, checked us out there and then assigned us to our wing, and the 15 Tactical Reconnaissance Wing at uh, Kimpo Air Force Base. One of the strange things that happened in war. Pete said that he was flying Mel's wing, that they were descending on the, in the target area. There were slow scud clouds. He said Mel went in, disappeared into one of the clouds. She says, I came through right behind him. He disappeared completely. He says, all I can figure is he took one right in the intake. We don't know. I don't know. I was born in a little town in South Dakota named Wolsey. Uh, I'm one of the few people left, I guess, that were born at home, not in a hospital. In 1900, almost all U.S. births occurred outside a hospital. But by 1940, out-of-hospital births fell to about 44%. At uh, two sisters, then the, my dad was a barber for the most part. Uh, so we weren't what you'd call living on the other side of the tracks because in our town there weren't any tracks. Eugene was only 11 years old when his life completely changed. What I was doing, I, my dad was bowling in a bowling league on Sunday night in Redfield, South Dakota, and uh, I was watching him, and uh, an announcement came over the loudspeaker that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Costly to our Navy was the loss of war vessels, airplanes, and equipment, but more costly to Japan was the effectiveness of its foul attack in immediately unifying America in its determination to fight and win the war thrust upon it and to win the peace that will follow. Uh, my dad was 40 years old and enlisted in the Army. Uh, his twin brother, an identical twin by the way, so my relatives tell me they look so much alike their mother couldn't tell them apart. He also enlisted. My dad trained in uh, heavy artillery maintenance and that sort of thing. And my uncle was uh, sent to uh, Louisiana training in jungle type environment. To keep his mind off his father being overseas, Eugene's schoolwork, his part-time job, and his mother kept him busy. Uh, just went to school and uh, I found a job. The sports editor uh, was scrambling around like everybody else 
looking for help. <clears throat> and for some reason, he asked me if I'd be interested in trying my hand at sports writing. And I said, sure. And uh, it was uh, an interesting time. I got to know a lot of baseball people and other athletic uh, endeavors. And so uh, it just basically uh, took one day as it came and uh, didn't whether my dad was in New Guinea or Moratai or finally Leyte in the Philippines, it didn't really impact me directly. My mom worked pretty hard, hard at uh, keeping us busy, so we didn't really have time to concern ourselves that Pop was uh, somewhere. Eugene's father's service in the Army had a huge influence on Eugene. After graduating high school in 1948, Eugene decided to follow in his father's footsteps and also enlist. My dad had already enlisted, and uh, I was, <clears throat> we had a draft board that was very open to you if you went up. And I went up and asked them where I was on the draft list. This was in January. And they said I was number one for February. And I went home and told my mom that uh, rather than get drafted, I was going to enlist if I could pass the test. My mother was accepting. She said, if you, if you want to do it, go ahead. I'm not going to like it, but if you want to do it, go ahead. He gave me the tests and so on, and I was lucky enough to pass them and got, uh, got my assignment to uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. I spent uh, my initial uh, enlistment in, at Lackland as a Beetle Stomper, a, a, uh, somebody that was in the Air Force doing whatever they told him to do. And <clears throat> there were so many guys enlisting so that they wouldn't be drafted into the infantry <clears throat> that there was a, an overload, a, a glut of <clears throat> guys and an awful lot of them that were looking to appointments to the Cadet Corps. <clears throat> because that was pretty nice duty, everybody thought. Nobody knew what it was like, but we all made up our minds that that might be a pretty good place to go. <clears throat> I got stuck in the food service squadron, which was the guys that were doing the KP, were doing the cooking, were doing this. The other area that was really being besieged with guys that wanted to be someplace else was the military police. That, those were, that was a good assignment too, a good duty. Basic training prepares recruits for all elements of service. It is a rigorous eight and a half week program of physical and mental training required in order for an individual to become a well-trained airman. About the second day that I was in basic training, I found out that things were a little different when one day uh, PFC came racing up the side hill at uh, Lackland Air Force Base and says, you guys get go get lost, get lost, get out of here. And what's going on, you know, that's strange. And uh, we uh, scattered, we're talking and, and the flight chief was walking by and somebody said, hey chief, what? What's going on? He says, never mind. And they said, yeah, but you told us to get lost. What's going on? He says, they're looking for people for KP, and if they catch you guys, I'm going to have to supervise you. And that was the story of how they, uh, the Army was different than, than uh, real life.
the recruits would go on to advanced pilot training after they passed basic pilot training. There were many different types of aircraft the men would fly during advanced pilot training. In Eugene's case, his unit would be flying the F-80. I went from uh, Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas, to visit a friend of mine from Aberdeen at, uh, down at uh, Ellington Air Force Base in Houston. And then my assignment was to uh, Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, they loaded us on a bus and shipped us up there and said, this is your home for the next six months. Uh, 52 was the year we graduated, and two was the second uh, group in the year. And uh, Charlie was our nickname for the thing, 52 Charlie to see Charlie. But uh, we are kind of funny because our, my class was about half multi-engine and half uh, single engine. And the way they worked it was everybody bid on the assignments. They'd say, okay, this assignment, we've got 10 guys, 10 spaces in Attu in the Aleutian Islands. Anybody that's interested in flying F-94s, all other interceptors in the Aleutian Islands, put your name, we all had name tag, they put your name tag in the hat, so they did, and they stirred it up and drew the names out, and the first 10 guys got that too. And uh, mine was rather, it says, we're looking for some guys to fly photo reconnaissance in uh, single engine jets in Korea. Korea didn't sound too good, but I, and they said, okay, those of you who are interested, put your name tags in the hat, and they didn't, and mine got drawn. So I was assigned to the uh, uh, tactical wing, air, tactical reconnaissance wing in Kimpo or Seoul, Korea. This one I was concerned a little bit because I figured it's, I'm supposed to go into combat, and yet they're taking the guns out of my airplane and putting cameras in it. It doesn't doesn't compute. They sent me to Sumter first to teach me how to take pictures with an airplane. Oh, the airplane that we're using was an F-80, RF-80, a reconnaissance F-80, and the nose of the aircraft was modified to hold three cameras, the 36-inch focal length, the 24-inch focal length, and the 12-inch focal length up in the nose. They give you a map with some dots on it, maybe three, four, five, and say, go take a picture of this and bring it back. So you take off, you navigate up there, you fly, you set the cameras the way they're supposed to set, and aim the, the line that you want to get the target in. And flip the switch and the camera starts running and you drive straight across the target until you're done and shut the camera off. After learning how to take photos in an airplane, Eugene and his squadron would be sent to Korea. We got our assignments. We went to Camp Stoneman, California. Uh, they set us up on uh, shuttle flights going to Hawaii and we all trucked aboard the, the bird and they took us to where we were supposed to go and uh, let us off and put, put us in another airplane that was configured a little bit differently and we took us to Guam so we got to see beautiful downtown Guam. She's, um, and then uh, we did whatever we were supposed to do there and they sent us on to, to Japan and uh, checked us out there and then assigned us to our wing, and the 15 Tactical Reconnaissance Wing at uh, Kimpo Air Force Base. It's about halfway between Incheon and, and uh, Seoul. 
and uh, so we got there. We all knew how to fly, how to take pictures, and what we didn't know was the terrain and what kind of enemy uh, problems we're going to run into. But I was pretty lucky. I I got shot at, but never shot down or shot up. So I felt like it was lucky me. Photo reconnaissance was a very dangerous but important role in the Korean War. The pilots were forced to fly at low altitudes so they could take clear and detailed photos which left them very vulnerable as they would often receive ground fire and couldn't fire back. The pictures that would come from these missions were very critical for the upcoming events because they often showed enemy movements and strengths. Get up about 6 o'clock, uh, have some, some breakfast, uh, go to uh, weather briefing. Our weatherman stormy every day was going to be terrible. Uh, but by 8 o'clock you were through with that, then you start your mission briefings and uh, tell you where you're going, what you're supposed to do, whether you're going to have an escort, whether you're going to be flying solo, whether you're going to be flying with a wingman, or just all of the bits and pieces that go to make up a mission. They'd give you a map, and in the map, they'd have little targets marked this is a this is a, de a map that i carried on on my knee in the airplane this is where we started from near seoul kimpo air force base and these are radials that direct directions that we fly to get to the target and this was a, called the holy land we couldn't fly over that that's where the peace talks were taking place so they'd identify certain targets maybe with a just a X or something like that and uh, if you're sitting up there at cruising along at about 280 knots and looking at the ground uh, 10,000 feet below you and you're trying to find that little spot on the map but the day was was get your mission fly your mission bring your back, debrief, get ready to fly another mission. Some days we'd fly as many as three. Fly solo probably three or four times a week. Uh, an actual solo mission to take pictures, uh, probably anywhere from two to five days a week, I, I would say. The Lockheed RF-80s that were flown for reconnaissance were almost 100 miles per hour slower than the Soviet MiG-15s. So in order to do missions close to the Yalu area, they would have to be escorted by the American F-86 Sabre. Uh, about the only time you ever got an escort was if you went up to the Yalu River, which was a Manchurian border. And you'd go up there and you're flying a 280 knot airplane. And the MiGs are climbing up on the opposite side of the Yalu River, getting above you, wanting to come across because they know those straight wings that the Americans are flying are slow comparatively speaking, to the MiGs. Uh, I found out that my flight leader was a classmate of mine, a flight leader to take me up and protect me and, and so on. Uh, so uh, we went about our business and we're tooling along and, and Tapper was, Tom Tapper was his name, was just kind of a character anyway. But like I say, the, the F-80, the straight wing was, a, much slower aircraft than the swept wing 86. Tapper was flying an 86. He was a, a fighter pilot. And uh, I'm tooling along, fat, dumb, and happy, and had no problems at all, till I look out and here's Tapper pulling up on my wing. Now what in the world? And all of a sudden, he, I, I could tell what he was doing. He popped his speed brakes and that slowed him down just like that. And so we're going along and he drops his speed brakes and I go on and then, and then he catches me quickly. And uh, he said, it's okay. I said, yeah, I got it, Tom. He says, no, no, no. He says, I just was checking to see that you were moving. I can really, I can say this honestly, that I was never frightened at 
of flying the combat mission. Eugene was a very confident pilot. He trusted in the equipment that was issued to him, and he trusted greatly in his plane. But with the amount of missions these pilots flew, unusual events were bound to happen. Pete said that he was flying Mel's wing, that they were descending on the, in the target area. There were slow scud clouds. He said Mel went in, disappeared into one of the clouds. He says, I came through right behind him. He disappeared completely. He says, all I can figure is he took one right in the intake. We don't know. I don't know. About three or four days later, maybe a week, there's a great big dumpster type thing that was brought into the camp. And lo and behold, it was Mel Monty's household goods. They were supposed to have been shipped from Shaw, Sumter, South Carolina, to his home in California. Somebody put the wrong label on and they sent all his household goods to Korea. And they had ridden in the hold of a cargo ship and the stuff was full of salt water. And, and we were, we, the photo guys were digging around in there. And, uh, came up with Monty's wedding album. And uh, they said, geez, look at that, what can we do? And well, Doug McLoney was our, our, uh, our photo officer. And he said, we'll fix them. And they did. But Monty was killed in that trip and his household goods wound up in Korea, and that's one of the strange things that happen in war sometimes. Like I say, Mel was the best man at his wedding. I think he, had, I think Pete went back home with his stuff and probably gave his wife whatever support he could. Nearly all of the pilots were just married with kids soon to be born. They were forced to leave their wives and they couldn't even be present for their firstborn child. The one thing uh, the Air Force tried to instill in their pilots was that uh, fighter pilots, babies are always boys. And uh, I was waiting for our first child to arrive, and uh, I was in the orderly room, and the corporal that was on mail call, I said, Theodore, and then I looked around, and the major was looking at me. I said, Corporal Walhall, <laughs> I said, if you don't bring me confirmation of the birth of my child, our child, when you come back from mail call, I said, don't come back. And uh, we uh, chuckle, 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 you know, and old Theodore, he went to get the mail and he came back and I looked out the window. He's waving this telegram. Lieutenant, I got it, I got it. You know, you know good for you, let's see it. I wasn't very uh, learned in the ways of fatherhood. And uh, I had a very smart wife that uh, she had raised four brothers, or, and so she was pretty well up to speed on it. And I got to admit that I, for me, I did a pretty good job. I kept her informed of what I was doing as best I could. And at the top of each letter in the upper left-hand corner, I'd put down the number of missions I'd completed because rotation was dependent upon flying 100 combat missions. And when I could put number 65 up there, that was better than 64. Eugene hit his 100th mission mark, and then he returned home after being in Korea for just about a year in December of 1953. Well, it was uh, interesting. We loaded up, uh, flew into Guam, had uh, some uh, something to eat, 
flew out of Guam, discovered that the airplane ahead of us had crashed, and we spent the next three hours looking for wreckage and bodies and stuff like that, and went our merry way, and they, I, don't, I still don't know what happened to that airplane, but it was ferrying troops home just like us. Uh, we flew into Minneapolis in a blizzard and uh, caught the wife and decided we were going to Murray's for dinner. I figured that out all the way between Guam and Honolulu and asking questions between Honolulu and San Francisco. And they said Murray's was the place to go and have a big steak of some sort. And she didn't need much, but uh, it was good to see her. I happened to have gotten the GI Bill, and I went back to school to get my master's. One guy that, that I met that pretty much personified everybody. I was back in college. I was walking down the hall. I ran into a guy that I'd known when I was there before. And I says, how you doing? He says, hey, Noonan, what are you doing back here? And I told him. I says, what about you? He says, oh, he says, I've gotten, uh, got my GI Bill and I've gotten my private pilot's license and I'm trying out to fly for the airlines. And I said, good grief, you? He said, yeah. And he looked at me and he grinned and he says, besides, I figured if you could do it, anybody could. Eugene, I know we haven't actually met each other, but I feel like we've been having daily conversations for the past eight months. You've really changed my perspective on war and made me realize how important photo recon is for everyday missions. Every time I see a plane on the ground, I can't help but imagine the photo of you standing on the wing of your plane. This image never fails to bring a smile to my face. I really hope that one day we can actually come to meet each other, but until then, thank you for sharing your war experience and for teaching me many valuable lessons. Eugene, you and 52 Charlie will always be in my heart. Thank you for your service and your life-changing story. When you hear 52 Charlie, what do you think and what do you feel? I think of a bunch of uh, <laughs> Uh, idiots that uh, enlisted in the Air Force and uh, got assigned at Lackland Air Force Base to, uh, by somebody that didn't know us from Adam and didn't really care too much. And uh, we, we were given an assignment and our assignment was to be in the third class that will graduate in 1952 and uh, be, be ready to do whatever they ask you so that you're ready to graduate and finally uh, make sure that you're, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because life in the military can be pretty good but it can be pretty bad if you screw it up and so give it your best.